sing our hymnals this morning. We're going to sing hymn number 298. 298, there is power in the blood. Let's sing the first, the second, and the last. Hymn number 298. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power. Power, power, wonder working power in the precious. passion and pride there's power in the blood power in the blood come for a cleansing to God there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb power wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb on that last verse. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you lift David's praise as to sing? sing this morning, you may be seated. It's not cathedrals, it's not steeples, it's not crosses made of gold. It's not just sentimental stories that have been passed down from old. It's not religion or tradition that can save the souls of men. He took the sinless blood of one holy lamb. It's all about the blood. All about Calvary, all about mercy flowing down, and old rugged tree, it's all about grace, all about sacrifice, redeeming love, it's all about the blood of Jesus Christ. There is a filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty Chapter 3 in verse 15, and as the people were in expectation, 
And all men mused in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. John the Baptist was precise in his preaching. He was not the Christ. He was only the voice in the wilderness. He was also precise that the ministry of the one, the Christ, the one whose shoes he was not worthy to unloose, was going to be evidenced by great power. It would be identified by fire. Fire that would purge and cleanse and purify. Fire that would empower those who would believe on Christ. And lastly, a fire that would bring perfect judgment upon all those who refuse to believe. Now as we near the end of Luke chapter 12, and I invite you to turn there now, the Lord Jesus, again, he's been on a journey now for several weeks that we have spent on this. He is on a journey nearing the city of Jerusalem. The work of salvation that Jesus would do upon the cross was, was really looming very large in his vision. And he was determined to complete that work. Indeed, he made it very plain that his face was set toward Jerusalem. And he understood that the impact of salvation, what it would have upon the eternal destiny of so many people, but he also knew how that salvation would actually affect the earthly lives of those who followed him. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to open the word of God, and I thank you, Lord, that you have gathered each one of us here today. We believe that we are here by your design. And Lord, I ask that you would give me clarity of thought and help me, Lord, to be most of all filled with thy spirit. And Lord, that I might uh, open and expound the word of God as you have led me to do. And I pray, Lord, that all of us would take careful attention to your words and may our hearts be receptive to you. And Lord, for this, we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 12 in verse 49. Jesus says, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? I am come to send fire on the earth. The fire of which John the Baptist had spoken had not yet fallen. The Lord Jesus was actually declaring his desire for that, his longing for that. John had said what in chapter 3? He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The Lord here in verse 49, the last part, and what will I, if it be already kindled? What will I? That expression, what will I, means to will, to desire, to long for, to determine. I sometimes like to look at earlier editions, and we know William Tyndale uh, was a greatly used of God to give us really the first complete uh, full English translation, or one of the very first, and one upon which our translators of the authorized version depended very heavily. But Tyndale's 1526 edition said this, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what is my desire that it were all ready kindled? You know, as they drew near to Jerusalem, the Lord longed for the time when he would indeed baptize his followers with the Holy Spirit and with power. You know, through this spirit baptism, those who would confess of their sins and would repent and believe upon him, they would be regenerated and born again by the Spirit. They would may, be made eternally alive as God's children. And you know what? Jesus longed for that. 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, nor of the uh, will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And they would be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And Jesus longed for that. He was yearning for that. They would no longer be alone, and he also longed for that. He said in John 14, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. They would be sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise as a down payment on heaven, and they would enjoy some of the experiences of their eternal life right here and right now. And Jesus longed for that. He desired that. Ephesians 1, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is the down payment on heaven. And they would be sanctified and set apart by the Holy Spirit's working in them to purify them. And Jesus longed for that day. And then they would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the fire of Pentecost would give them great boldness in the work of God. And Jesus was longing for that as well, as Acts tells us. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Can you see this? The Lord Jesus was yearning for the day. He said, I'm going to send fire upon the earth. I, I want to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And he was longing for this because regeneration and dwelling and sealing and sanctifying and empowering work of the Holy Spirit would become active in people's lives. But there was also another aspect of that fire. Verse 17 in chapter 3, we also read, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, speaking of the threshing floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, his storage, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. The Lord also was desiring for that final judgment to come, to at last bring justice and then peace to the earth. We're not imagining this. Luke did not dream this up. It is here written for us in God's word. The Lord had come to kindle two kinds of fire. Pentecostal fire and punitive or punishing fire. Now, we read from the book of Joel this morning in our scripture reading, and there it was talking about a kind of fire that God was looking for, that Pentecostal type of fire. And you know, that, that Pentecostal fire could have, could have swept the nation of Israel had that nation responded. And had they responded and accepted Christ as their Messiah, he would have ushered in. He came offering them the kingdom. And he, it would have ushered in that wonderful kingdom of God upon earth. But Israel's stubborn rejection of their Messiah sealed their doom. You see, the Pentecostal fire did come, all right, but instead of bringing in a Jewish millennial kingdom, so to speak, it brought power to believers and churches. Instead, do you know what fell on Israel? The punishing fire. The Romans came in A.D. 70 and destroyed Jerusalem and their temple. And they came back again in A.D. 135 and put an end to Jewish national life. The Jews were dispersed. They ceased to be a nation. And they were left to wander the world, constantly hated and hounded everywhere they went. Now, it's important for us to understand some things. That today, in God's wisdom, Israel has been regathered. And their national life has resumed. The times of the Gentiles, the, and our times as churches on earth, is really about over. The moment that the rapture takes place and believers are removed, God's going to send that Pentecostal fire again. And this time it will indeed fall upon Israel. And Joel's prophecy that we read about is going to be complete and fulfilled in all of its fulfillment. And people will be saved in spite of the rage of the Antichrist. And we have 144,000 Jewish evangelists who will preach the gospel of the kingdom to the earth's farthest corners. And countless millions of souls will be saved. That's what Revelation 7 is all about. 
But then the Lord will also send fire once again of the punitive sort to make short work of the Antichrist and his wickedness. But the Lord's disciples in our text right here, they don't have a clue. They don't understand this at all. It's not been revealed to us and to them at this point. Jesus' desire, I am come to send fire on the earth. I'm anxious for this. And what will I if it already be kindled? I'm ready for this to happen. But verse 50, he says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. Oh, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? You see, the grim reality was that the Lord understood that before he would do that baptizing work with the Holy Spirit and with power, he must first accept the baptism of his own. And that baptism of his own was that he would die a sacrificial death for you and I. And this is the understanding that confronted him really and no one else. His disciples didn't understand it. And I don't believe that we can fully understand it. And it brought great distress to his soul. Notice he said, how I am straightened until this be accomplished. Now, we don't use the word as it's used much in, this, in our Bibles today, the word straightened. But it means to be make narrow. Uh, we think of um, a straight jacket. Somebody uh, has to wear one because they're going to be a danger to themselves and maybe others, and so they're, they're bound up in something that uh, restrains them and confines them. It, it shows up in our maps. We think about the, the Straits of Georgia just off our coast, a, a place where the sea lanes grow narrow. And the Greek word that Luke used means to constrain or to restrict. So what made this waiting? Jesus said, uh, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and, and I'm constrained by it. What, what was it? Why was this waiting for that to take place? Why was that so difficult for him? Why was it straightening for him? Well, it was, I think we understand, it was not just the coming physical abuse and pain that distressed him, although it was terrible in itself. But most of all, it was the necessity of him taking upon himself your sin and mine. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Lord said, I'm straightened in this. It's not something I'm looking forward to. Boy, how this great love sets the Lord Jesus Christ above any false teacher, any false religionist. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know that we can ever fully understand the great agony of soul that overcame the Lord Jesus for our sin. When we read the, the details and what God has allowed us to see into from the gospel accounts, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. <coughs> Father, glorify thy name. In Luke 22, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. You know, folks, I think it is so important for us to understand how much Jesus Christ loved you. How much he endured. Isaiah, even, we talked about last week, Isaiah 50, he shall see the travail of his soul. And if you have never trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation... I urge you 
to look to him today. The Lord longed to bring fire upon the earth. His desire was that that fire would be already kindled. But he first had to undergo the baptism of death on the cross, shed his precious blood for us, and he could not wait to get it done. He said, I'm anxious for this to go. The Lord Jesus wanted to move forward with great purpose to the cross. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it already be kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. Now let's look at verse 51. It goes on. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. From henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now the division described here is really very heartbreaking. It's the worst kind. A family is divided. Even torn apart by what? By faith in Christ. You know, it was shocking news to the disciples because in reality, this is not what they were expecting. I mean, the theme of the Lord's coming had been what? The angels sang it. Glory to God in the highest and on earth what? Peace, goodwill toward men. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government is upon, shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called what? Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But now what does he say? Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. The 12 had to be shocked, but he had their attention. I mean, this was and is spiritual reality. I've been reading through the Gospel of John in in, in my devotional time, in in John chapter 9 and in in chapter 10 as well, both times it talks about the people, how they were divided even while he was still here, and there was a division among them about Jesus. The people were arguing about him. Is he good? Is he bad? Is he right? Is he wrong? Is he the Messiah? No, he can't be the Messiah. How could he do this? And there was division already. The very mention of the name Jesus tore apart uh, uh, the established Jewish religion. Uh, We know during those early uh, centuries, really, of the Roman Empire, the mere mention of his name could end up for you to be in prison or worse. And we know that to the religions of this world today, the name of Jesus Christ is always a pain and an obstacle. Everybody wants to say, let's get together and let's have a multi-faith gathering. Let's all worship together and all this kind of stuff. And let's be frank. In our modern day Canadian society, are we open and warm or hostile towards the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see... The name of Jesus Christ always produces some type of painful decision. Sometimes even in the most personal of relationships. You see, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, he drew a pretty bold line in the sand. He said, you want to have a relationship with God, you want to to have an eternity in heaven, there's only one way, and it's through me. Acts tells us, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, Jesus did not come to tell people that all paths lead to heaven. He never said that. He did not come to tell people that what you believe doesn't really matter just as long as you believe something. The Lord Jesus did not teach people that that all people are good and they just need to be guided. Jesus didn't say, well, you can go ahead and, 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 and do whatever you want, just don't hurt anybody. His proclamation was pretty precise. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, the reality is, and the message that he gave to his disciples about a, a fire and them, and he tried to get them to understand that if they believe upon him and trust in him and he becomes their savior and they determine to live for him, they will experience division. Second Timothy puts it this way, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a fact. But can I tell you something? That faith in Christ does also generate peace. Peace where it matters the most. Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that means I've been reconciled to God. I'm no longer at enmity with God. I have a relationship with Him. He has become my Heavenly Father, and He gives me His peace. John 14, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Philippians 4, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But he said, I want you to know that in those human relationships, there will be division because not all will believe on Christ. Well, let's look at verse 54, and I want you to see fire in us and a need for discernment. And he said, unto the, he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye say, there cometh a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, Oh, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? Hmm. Now, the Lord has been moving towards Jerusalem with the twelve and a few other disciples, but now it seems that others have gathered, and it says he says to all the people. So there's a, the crowd is gathering, and they're listening to his lessons, and so now he addresses everyone. I find it interesting that the weather's brought up. You know, people have been trying to figure out the weather since there's been weather. And uh, the reality is we've learned down through the years that there are certain patterns that most of the time, not always, can be predicted. And so the Lord said, you see a cloud in the west? Hey, you know that rain's usually coming from the west in that part of the world, and so you know it's going to rain, or you feel that warm heat coming, you know, breeze blowing, you know it's going to get hot, and all those things. And so you and I, we listen to News 1130 and Rustley Kate and all the guys over there, and hmm. But his rebuke to the people is this. You can look at the sky, you can feel the wind, and you can figure out whether it's going to rain or whether it's going to be hot and dry. And yet they could not understand the fulfillment of Scripture that was going on all around them. And they could not figure out that their Messiah was standing in front of them. They were so earthly focused that they missed all the heavenly message. And you know, that's really where we live. We live in that day where people are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the winds are there. You know, the signs are all around us. We often speak of the signs of the times, and while that is true, we do not know the hour he's coming, as we saw last week. We do know that there is much evidence that his coming is soon. And the reality is, are we watching the spiritual signs as much as we go outside and say, boy, I wonder if it's going to break off today. It's sure like a few more days of sun and before the rain. Yeah. You see, most people prefer to ignore or deny the signs all around us. And we have a world culture that despite of all the witness that has been set before them. And they reject the good news of Jesus Christ and that he died for them. And I have to tell you that the fire that's coming will not be 
the fire of God's empowerment for them, but the fire of God's judgment. Now, having issued a warning, we close with these words. Verse 58. And when thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him. Lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison, I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last mite. Hmm. Now having given a warning, the Lord Jesus now says to this crowd and to us, advice on how to prepare for judgment. Now, did you catch what he was saying? He's saying the reality is you need to give some diligence. If you, if you have an indebtedness to somebody, and it's gotten to the place where you're getting ready to go to court over this thing, or there's some other type of offense, he said you would be smart to try to get a settlement before you go to court. You would, be, you would be better off to try to see if you can come up with some sort of, you know, without going all the way to the court, without going before the judge, without because when you get there, you're going to pay. So if you can come up, I think there was a, a, a the Lord told a story, a parable about a, a man that uh, who was going to be cast out of his job, and what did he do? He went around to all of the creditors, and he said, look, how much do you owe the master? He said, 100 bushels of wheat. All right, write down 50. We'll take that. And then there was, a, how many barrels of oil? 100. Well, we'll take 80. And he did all of this, sort of trying to remedy all this before it got to that crisis moment. And what the Lord is saying is, look, there is judgment coming. If you'll awaken to that fact, the smart thing for you to do is to get this settled before you stand before God. You see, and it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. You know, the Lord offers to every one of us, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God says, I'm giving you an opportunity. You have an opportunity to, to settle this. We, the men's quartet many years ago used to sing that old song, the old account was settled long ago. What is that all about? I came to Christ. I recognized my indebtedness. I was a sinner. Nothing that I can do about my sin, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. I understood that my judgment, the wages of sin is death, and I didn't want to confront that and be faced with that. And so when the Lord said, come unto me, I went. And I asked his forgiveness. And I confessed my sin unto him. And because of that, Jesus forgave me and made me his child. I know a lot of people, most people don't like to think of themselves as being sinners. But God has spoken and who are we to deny his word? You know, the reality is, is that some of the great characters of this Bible that we hold in, in high esteem understood they were sinners. The Apostle Paul, so mightily used of God, said what? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of what? Of whom I am chief. Our judgment before God it's not going to be based upon your good works or mine. We understand that. We're headed for a certain judgment. But God says, I'm offering you an opportunity to take care of this before it's too late. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him. I wonder uh, today, what's your standing with the Lord? Do you know him as your personal savior? Are you absolutely certain? See, the, the reality is Jesus is giving us all these warnings saying this time is coming. You can discern the sky. You can tell the weather. You can tell all these kind of things. 
But you're missing the boat. My judgment is coming. I'm going to baptize this world with fire. I'm going to bring this judgment, this purifying on it. And you need to be ready because when that day of judgment comes for you, are you going to be able to stand and say, you know what? Lord, I settled this out of court. <laughs> Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. So I stand before you, Lord, justified. I stand today forgiven. And I want you to make certain that you do so today. Father, we thank you.